Um, and of course, within England itself, we've seen um, uh, uh, major um, political um, debates, particularly between um, the cities of the north of England and uh, the UK government, uh, which has been forced, as it were, by the crisis and the devolved nature of public health responsibilities to act as the English government um, when it comes to uh, restrictions in England, uh, the so-called tiering system. Uh, and the emergence of figures like Andy Burnham, the mayor of uh, Greater Manchester, as vocal figures for advocating on, on behalf of the interests of the people of Manchester and other parts, uh, newly crowned uh, King of the North, indeed, um, in his response. So some very big questions that we've got to discuss here about what all these things mean for the politics of the United Kingdom and the future of England, both within the Union and the future of devolution in particular, within England itself. And as people will know, next year, we've got some major political events coming up, which will shape a number of these questions fundamentally for the future, the May uh, elections, particularly in Holyrood, where the Scottish National Party appear set to uh, win another uh, resounding victory on a mandate for another referendum on independence in Scotland. But we also have elections to uh, mayoralities in the metro mayors uh, in England, um, and we are promised a, a white paper on devolution by the government itself. Michael Gove just been in front of the Public Accounts Committee, Public um, Administration Committee, I should say, this afternoon, uh, saying a bit more about, about that question. So uh, lots happening next year, which will have a big impact on the questions we're here to discuss. Uh, our first speaker is uh, Professor Michael Kenny. Uh, Mike is um, inaugural director of the Bennett Institute for Public Policy uh, at the University of Cambridge and author of an acclaimed uh, book on uh, English politics, the, uh, the politics of English nationhood, um, a, 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 an expert not just in uh, questions of Englishness and uh, the political expression of Englishness, but also in relations between the nations of the UK, on which he's been doing work recently. Uh, Michael kick us off uh, this afternoon. He'll be followed by uh, Patrick Diamond. Patrick is a senior lecturer in public policy at, at Queen Mary at the University of London. Um, and uh, 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 Patrick has held a, a number of senior posts in central governments, uh, worked with me, as it happens, uh, at 10 Downing Street before uh, taking up his academic post uh, and writes on uh, British politics, uh, particularly the, the labour tradition, intellectual and political traditions uh, in, uh, uh, in the UK, and, um, and also on questions of, of the state and the central state in particular. And so Patrick um, will be our second speaker. And then finally, uh, Professor Elsa Henderson, um, professor at the University of Edinburgh, um, which she joined in 2007 from Toronto. And um, Professor Henderson works on uh, issues around the relationship between political culture and behavior uh, in federal and multinational states and is the um, principal investigator on some very important surveys in the UK, Scottish election study, future of uh, Englishness survey. So again, a lot of work on these qu the question of sort of rising English sentiment, English political expression, um, as well as on uh, Scotland and on wider questions of multi-level uh, governance. So a great lineup of speakers for us this afternoon, uh, and I'm going to ask Mike to kick us off. Mike Kenny. Thanks very much, uh, Nick, and to um, colleagues at the uh, Centre on Constitutional Change for inviting me. So um, I'm going to talk a bit about um, governance and devolution in England we're in comparison to devolution as it's been developed elsewhere in the UK. Um, and to do that, I'm, I'm going to start by just drawing attention to what I think are a number of really important and quite difficult ambiguities about what devolution means or should mean in the English setting. And my point really is that until we work our way, we accept those ambiguities, we try to work our way through them, um, we're unlikely to make progress, I think, in this area in terms of making meaningful devolution happen. And to work our way through those ambiguities, we need first to name and understand them. So that's what I'm going to try and do. Um, I'm going to highlight three. Um, actually, in preparing for this, my list grew longer and longer, but I, I'm going to stop at three. I think there are uh, other issues we could pick up on as well. The first, it seems to me, is the most fundamental ambiguity, which is what does devolution in the English context actually mean? And there are two very broad and quite different options, it seems, here, different potential answers to that. One is, is devolution, as is most commonly assumed, about developing a more robust and maybe comprehensive system of devolved governance within England at 
a regional scale, however that's defined, sitting between local councils on the one hand and central government on the other. And that, that project often goes by the name of regional devolution. And it's a project that's most commonly associated in British politics with uh, the Labour and Lib Dem side of the political spectrum, though they're not exclusively. There are, there are certainly Conservatives who think in these terms as well. There is a, 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 a sort of ambiguity nestled within that perspective, which I'm going to touch on in a moment, about whether that is the right scale, the right level at which to build mezzanine layer governance in this context. So one answer to the question is, what, what does it mean? Well, it means building regional government. But there's a second answer, which feels pretty different and perhaps incommensurable with the first, and that's the idea that maybe it means developing some form of recognition or representation for England as a national community, following on from the logic of devolution elsewhere, to Scotland and Wales in particular. And if you think of the debates that have developed over the last 20 years, there is a spectrum of, of options, or a spectrum of different proposals about how you might do this, which range one end to the idea some people propose, propose of some kind of symmetrical model of devolution, which leads you to something like an English parliament. That's at one end, the kind of maximal end, I think, right across to a more minimal um, answer, which is something like English votes for English laws, a sort of inter institutional device to just provide English MPs with a veto in the, in the Parliament, in Westminster Parliament, over issues on issues that only affect England. Now, there are actually other, mostly as yet, not very fully considered options between those different points on the spectrum, which might be considered in terms of giving England a greater voice within parliamentary government or some form of institutionalised representation within the executive. Um, I think what's striking about this kind of answer is that it's more commonly associated with the conservative side in British politics, but again, not exclusively, there are exceptions to that. Now, in terms of answering the English question in that way, of course, the, the issue of the disproportionate size of England territorially and its population compared to other parts of the UK is a recurrent and for many people, seemingly impossible challenge to surmount. And it's a particular challenge for those who want to advocate a more federal solution or home rule all round, as it used to be called. Now, I think one of the striking things about the debate on this is that is that which of those approaches you go with is still fundamentally un uncertain or is, is, has not been resolved in British politics 20 years after devolution was introduced elsewhere. In fact, there's a pretty deeply rooted disagreement but not often even an articulated disagreement. It's just there in the different parties and reflects their very different understandings of, of the nature of England and the identities of its people. Most expert commentary has tended to assume that any kind of maximalist version of English devolution, something like English Parliament or English representation is just incompatible with the UK. But it's quite notable, re reflecting back on these debates, that there's been very little attention paid to what I would call the middle part of that spectrum of options. And I think also very little attention paid to the possibility that devolution might mean both of those answers. It may be that it's not a zero sum question, that it might mean decentralisation and thinking about some different um, representation for England as a nation. I think it's very interesting if you look at the identity side of this, the, the kind of public attitudes to these questions. I, I know that Elsa will be talking in much more informed way than I can about those, so I'm gonna I'm gonna halt there. But I think the issue of whether it is possible to make to advance and to make headway on this question in a way that doesn't tailor to some degree to the growing interest of many people in England in having some form of English representation at the level of, of parliamentary government. I think that's a very important and difficult question. That's the first ambiguity. The second one I'll cover a bit more quickly. What is devolution in the English context for? What is its core purpose? How does it compare with devolution as introduced elsewhere? In Wales and Scotland, broadly put, the introduction of devolution was framed, certainly at the centre of British politics, as being about decentralisation, but also ideas of, of recognition, recognising those nations, giving them some 
form of greater self-determination and there were other benefits economic policy and other benefits that would be seen to to follow as well if you contrast that kind of justification with arguments for that have been used when regional government was attempted by labor after after in the, during the Blair governments or by the combined authority model that the coalition and the conservative governments went for, totally different justification for devolution in the English context. There, it's much more about the core goals of economic development and trying to address the growing gulf in regional productivity and economic performance. And that I think is very telling. It reflects the very different perspective that this at the center of that, that lives at the center of British politics on these different parts of the UK. England is still by and large taken to be the core territory and the direct responsibility of the central state. And so devolution generally is seen, and I think this works across the two main parties, it's not a party political point, it's generally seen in terms of how any new system can better deliver the core priorities and goals of the state. And those ideas were, were carried forward after 2010 in the model of bilateral negotiation with different local authorities pursued under the coalition and then the Tory government. What I think is striking here is, I mean, there's always been a rhetoric around this, that there would be some civic benefits and that this would be, this would kind of promote um, community benefit and engagement. But that kind of discourse has been much more marginal in the case of England. And I think that represents a very stark contrast to how devolution has been understood and indeed delivered elsewhere. That said, there are one or two points of similarity, I think, or connection to devolution in other parts of the UK that are worth pointing out. One of those is, is a lesson that I think the recent episode that Nick mentioned, the, the Northern Mayors, standing up to Boris Johnson, I think that episode really throws us into relief. And it's that if you do establish political systems elsewhere, however, however weakly constituted they may be, there is a good chance that the, the local politics that emerges will be shaped by a competition over who's best placed to stand up to central government. And then I think it added to that, that the particular model of the Metro Mayor, the directly elected mayor, which George Osborne was, was insistent on, has actually given figures like Andy Burnham a such stronger mandate in terms of, 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 of being able to stand up to the centre. So I think that's an interesting reflection on what is clearly a weak and underdeveloped system, but there still is the potential there to develop um, a kind of a political, uh, a more decentralising political dynamic. The third ambiguity I just want to touch on is subnational devolution in England. What's the appropriate scale for that? S some of the architects of devolution back in the Blair governments um, were pretty convinced that it was possible to evolve a model of regional governance out of the regional development agencies which they'd introduced. And of course, that project came to a shuddering halt in 2004, the Northeast referendum. Now, there may be good functional arguments for having governance at that scale, but there is absolutely huge evidence that the region as a geographical entity is almost entirely alien to the English psyche which is much more geared towards thinking about towns or cities or indeed counties as a source of place-based identity. And that I think does represent a major challenge to, that hasn't really been addressed by those who are thinking in terms of a kind of macro regional model. The coalition government then the Tories opted for a different spatial scale, thinking about cities, surrounding regions, combining authorities. And it seems to me that it's absolutely imperative that, that this becomes a wider debate, that we have a much more serious look at what is the appropriate geography for decentralising and don't let this just remain uh, it's, it's being a kind of low level political football. Very final point um, is that I think one of the most striking features um, of, of developments in this area is the, the way in which English governance has become increasingly confusing and opaque, I would argue, for many of the people who live in England. And it's that's for different reasons. There's been a multiplication of different types of authority and overlapping of jurisdictions. I think contracting out services and having public health systems that don't join up with um, governing authorities. All of that, I think,
has over time come to really make many English people quite jaded about some of this, the, the, the structures that govern them. And it seems to me that actually until we really internalize that problem and also look hard at the lessons, good and bad, of the, of the devolved system that we've built and of the metro mayors in particular, then we're not going to make much progress on this issue. Thank you very much. Great, thanks very much in, indeed, Mike. Um, that sets out the territory very clearly for us. Thank you very much indeed. Um, let's go across now to, to Patrick Diamond. Patrick, uh, can we marry? Over to you. Uh, well, thanks, Nick, and um, many thanks to the Centre on Constitutional Change for inviting me to, um, to be with you this afternoon. It's uh, a really, I think, interesting and important topic that we're, that we're discussing. Um, I just want to make three, hopefully, relatively brief sets of comments, Nick, and hopefully that will create some stimulus for questions and, and comments from the audience. Um, so I want to begin by just talking generally about the local government sector as a whole across England. Um, then I want to talk about how it's responded to the pandemic. And then thirdly, I want to talk more specifically about how the pandemic has affected governance in terms of English devolution um, in the uh, city regions that Mike was just talking about. I think it's important just to begin though by focusing on the local government sector as a whole, because obviously for most of England, that's the predominant governance tier um, beneath the uh, national um, government level. And I think it's something of a generalisation, but nonetheless true that the local government sector um, went into this pandemic crisis in a general state of demoralisation. Um, the reasons for that are various. Obviously, fiscal austerity, which has been particularly harshly pursued against local government over the last decade, has had a major effect on the general state of morale in the sector. I think also there's been a view that centralisation has been an inexorable tide which has been underway for several decades and which has denuded local government of policy making powers and responsibilities and a feeling that it's not really valued by Whitehall. I think add to that also the sense in local government that really over the last couple of decades it's kind of witnessed two false dawns when it believed that there might be a renaissance of local government but actually in the end didn't come to much. One of those was obviously 1997, the arrival of New Labour in government, which at the time I think many people in local government thought might herald um, a major era of decentralisation to the local government here. Of course, for various reasons, um, some of which you may want to comment on later, Nick, um, that never happened. Um, obviously, there is a view among some scholars and researchers that you know, New Labour's approach was really one of inveterate centralisation, couldn't get away from the idea that it needed to micromanage public services. Many of the modernisation programmes that were put in place relied on regulation and inspection from the centre, which really meant that any kind of um, concerted decentralisation was, was unlikely to happen. And then, of course, in 2010, a new government came to office, a coalition, Conservative Liberal Democrat government, which again, at the time, both in opposition um, and then immediately um, after arriving in government, there was some significant rhetoric about the importance of localism, the big society and so on. Indeed, also some legislation like the 2011 Localism Act, but all of which in the end proved to be something of a damp squib in terms of shifting substantive powers and responsibilities to the local government tier. And of course, added to that, as I've mentioned already, there was um, very harsh and significant spending cuts, which as I've said, obviously had a major effect on the morale and, and state um, of the sector. And I think also added to this across the period, there's just a general sense in English local government that they're not really understood by central government, that many ministers and officials have a rather dismissive attitude towards the local authority sector. Um, they're either ignorant of what local government does or they're actually actively hostile to local government, believing that somehow local government is not capable of delivering policies in a competent way. So. You know, that's history, but I think it's important just to bear it in mind because it kind of sets the context and it brings me on to my second point about how has local government responded to the COVID-19 crisis? Well, just developing and building upon what I've said, local government has come into the crisis, I think, generally on the back foot. Um, and it's true, I think, to say that the response to the COVID-19 pandemic has rather confirmed the general tide of centralisation, which is shaped outcomes within the English state. Just as a, a, to make a few more specific examples, just to develop the point, um, obviously as the pandemic has unfolded over the last nine or ten months, 
the test and trace system and the public health strategy have been largely determined by the centre in Whitehall. And by the way, that's despite the fact that responsibilities for public health were specifically passed to local authorities following the 2012 Lansley NHS reform. So even despite that piece of uh, decentralisation, um, the approach to public health has been fundamentally centralising. In addition to that, of course, the local government sector feels very hollowed out. Um, over the last 20 or 30 years, over time, policy has been increasingly reliant on being implemented through an outsourced delivery chain, ever greater focus on contracting out, commissioning, managed markets, um, the use of private sector providers, which has also shaped the response to COVID-19. And of course, all of this really emphasises that local authorities in England have relatively little policy discretion or countervailing power. Their ability to resist the centre is limited. And of course, they depend on the centre for financing. Um, two thirds of local government revenues come from the centre in Whitehall. That makes local government extremely dependent on the goodwill and beneficence of the centre. And of course, also local authorities have been frustrated by the fact that looking towards even shaping post pandemic recovery strategies, their ability to shape areas like economic development is also quite limited. Capital investment and spending on infrastructure tends to be very tightly controlled by the centre, as we know. Um, and as I've emphasised already, um, the response to COVID-19 was also, of course, influenced or um, negatively affected by the ongoing effects of austerity. Just one um, example, which I want to just give very quickly, is that um, came across the, this the other day that local authority emergency planning in England has had its expenditure cut by 35 percent in real terms since 2009-10. So in terms of local government coming into the crisis with its capacities to coordinate emergency response, what was obviously a very serious public health emergency, kind of level of cuts and the impact of fiscal austerity in local government um, have been um, very significant indeed. I think all of this has occurred despite the fact that COVID-19 has really exposed the limitations of central government in terms of its ability to coordinate effective local interventions and to process effectively relevant information relating to localities and their populations. You know, COVID-19 requires um, an ability for governance institutions to tailor policy interventions according to the needs of local populations. And with the kind of weakened and demoralised local government sector that I've been talking about, that has been much harder to achieve. Um, and, and also, I think, a recognition among some, in, some officials, some civil servants, that Whitehall itself has appeared very overloaded. Uh, Nick may have reflections on this himself, having worked in a number of Whitehall departments, but it feels as if, at times, Whitehall has just simply been trying to do too much. And that's caused serious problems in terms of the pandemic response. Um, although that's a very negative picture, I should also say, though, and there may be people on, on, in the seminar this afternoon who want to talk about some of these issues, it's also true to say that local government has demonstrated in some areas um, a capacity for significant innovation. Um, I think interventions which have been designed to harness community power, um, to provide support for vulnerable and shielding groups, also to develop policies that um, redesign transport systems, climate change adaptation, and all of that, which, is, which in a sense harness the opportunities afforded by the crisis to try and make some serious headway in these um, big um, policy areas. So I don't want to paint a picture of absolute gloom. I think some local authorities have obviously shown a great capacity for innovation, but nonetheless they've done so against a backdrop which has made their ability to do that um, somewhat limited or constrained. So Nick, in the final two minutes, let me just say a few words about the third point, which is about um, English devolution, more specifically in relation to the city regions. Mike touched on some of these points. Um, already. Um, obviously, we have to give some credit to the previous government for the fact that English devolution through city regions has advanced over the last five or six years. Um, the arrival of directly elected mayors, the <clears throat> emergence of the Northern Powerhouse model, which was championed by George Osborne. I think there is some sense that they have begun to at least shift at the margins um, the um, English governance landscape. Having said all of that, though, it's difficult not to interpret English devolution over the last decade. And it's difficult not to come to the conclusion that it reflects to some degree a process of elite co-option, as many scholars have themselves concluded, in the sense that um, local leaders and stakeholders have some notional policy autonomy, 
but in practice, because of funding structures and inadequate powers at the devolved level, they're drawn into effectively delivering the priorities of Westminster. And there's very little in terms of the COVID crisis so far, um, the way in which mayors were to some degree excluded from the COVID response, with the possible exception of Sadiq Khan, who was initially invited to some COBRA briefings, but then disinvited, um, I think rather uh, affirms that picture. And also the fact that the city regions were not really accorded any particular powers or funding um, to deal with the COVID crisis. I think having said that, though, it, it is striking that um, city region mayors have begun to assert their position more strongly in national debate. Um, the nine English mayors have pushed for a greater role in shaping the post-pandemic recovery strategy. They've been pursued important social policy changes, not least trying to enhance the support arrangements for individuals unable to work because of needing to self-isolate. Um, as has been mentioned, the fact that mayors like Andy Burnham have been able to some degree to break through in the national political scene um, by making arguments about, for example, the limitations of the tiered lockdown approach and the way that which and the way in which that has threatened national unity. And so it is possible that a long-standing effect of the crisis may be to um, strengthen the authority and, and legitimacy of city mayors, particularly with ministers and with Whitehall. But the final thing to say, and I'll end on this, is that, of course, the big question here is whether mayors can um, do this um, in, in the long term, given that the powers which they possess are what we would, I think, conventionally um, conceive of as largely soft powers, powers to influence, powers to project, powers to influence political debate, but where of course formal hard powers are somewhat weak. And so whether mayors can really reverse the pattern of incremental centralisation in English government since the 1980s, I think remains a very live question. But that's something we might discuss in, in, in the seminar subsequently. So I'll leave it there. Thanks, Nick. Great. Thank you very much indeed, Patrick. Uh, there's lots to discuss there. Thanks very much. Um, right. Uh, we'll, we'll now move to, to Professor Henderson. Elsa Henderson, um, if, if, you, if you're online now, Elsa, I'll hand over to you. Yep, I'm here. Yeah, thanks. Thanks very much. Um, and thanks very much to the CCC for the invitation uh, to speak here today. Uh, a lot of my thinking on, on this is informed by, by co-directing since 2011 the Future of England survey which conducts annual surveys of, of public opinion on English identity, attitudes to governance, attitudes to the EU, and has since 2018 conducted parallel surveys in Scotland, Wales, and Northern Ireland for a, a State of the Union survey. Now, a, asymmetric evolution places England in, a, in an unusual place because um, Westminster acts for the whole of the UK in some, uh, in some guises and acts only for, for England in, in others, which we, which we know. And this is, a, this is an automatic corollary of, of asymmetric devolution. What isn't automatic and is in fact unique to the UK is that this asymmetry is treated as a, as a furtive secret in a way. So the UK government and the Conservative and Labour parties have form for being vague about the territorial reach of policy proposals or announcements. And so they often refer to this country when at times this country means the UK or sometimes it means England. And the result is that the English electorate has not been fed a reliable or a diet of reliable information about devolution or the extent of governance arrangements around the UK uh, or their consequences for, for policy variation. Now, a lack of clarity about the territorial reach of policy might seem as something that would be only of interest to, to political scientists, but the COVID pandemic has revealed both a lack of awareness about this on the part of the electorate and journalists and politicians, um, but also a lack of precision, both from journalists and, and politicians, about the legislative competence of the devolved administrations as well as variation across England in terms of devolution or subsidiarity arrangements and the, 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 the different hats that the UK government wears from time to time. But I'll, I'll, come back to, I'll come back to COVID. Almost 10 years of studying public opinion in England reveals a number of tensions uh, around English governance and also presents five 
obvious challenges. And these dovetail nicely, I think, with what Mike was was saying earlier. So the first thing we know is that people in England are not happy with the status quo in terms of governance arrangements. Usually only around 15, 16% are happy with the status quo and don't have a preference for some other solution. Um, uh, a sense of missing English voice is animating much of this discontent and partly that's related to devolution anxiety and partly that's related to Euroscepticism, which is part of our two unions argument, but it's more than this, uh, it's, it's more than this alone. And related to this, proposals that are popular in England treat England as an indivisible unit. So around two thirds of the English electorate, if they want a solution, they want that solution to treat England as England, rather than to carve it up into other regions uh, or, uh, or in terms of a preference for, for city deals. So this is challenge number one, really, this, this, this unmet desire for, for English voice coupled with furtive asymmetry on, on the part of the status quo. So the, the policy solution that is most often presented, um, you know, regional, uh, regional greater regional devolution within England is a sound democratic idea if the goal is greater subsidiarity but if the goal is to treat that as a solution for absent voice then that solution is never going to address the initial problem that's there which is the missing voice so it has certain benefits in terms of subsidiarity but it doesn't meet that unmet demand in terms of English voice now, the UK government and political parties have responded to this by masking the existence of devolution, failing to clarify when the UK government acts for, for England alone, using vague language about the country or across this land. And the result is that it seems to be framing policy so that people can believe that it applies to whichever community matters to them at that particular moment. So you can conceive of it applying to your demos or your polity or your community, and you're never really confronted with details because it's left in such vague language. That's challenge number one, the unmet voice and furtive asymmetry. The second challenge, of course, Mike mentioned this earlier, is, of course, English size. So if we can distinguish between these different solutions for English governance, ones that treat England as an indivisible whole, and others that focus on city regions, um, or, or regional devolution, then we have a certain problem because the ones that are popular, the indivisible whole arguments, are seen to be uh, less palatable in terms of the institutional structures of the, the constitutional status quo at the moment. So the overwhelming demographic weight of England demands almost that you can't have England treated as equal to Scotland or Wales or Northern Ireland because of their size. And so therefore we need some form of federalism is most often mentioned but that proposal which satisfies the institutional demands doesn't satisfy the electorate's demands in terms of of what they want so english size is another form of challenge so english voice and english size in terms of challenge number three uh, i think the best way to to refer to this would be the challenge of of British identity, the emptiness of British identity as a, as a unifying force. Now, what, one of our findings is that British identity is aligned with completely different attitudes in different parts of the UK. So British identifiers in England voted Remain, but British identifiers in Scotland and Wales voted leave. British identifiers in England are relatively happy with devolution, but British identifiers in Scotland and Wales less so. And the same is true if you're looking at the, the territorial identities as well. So English identifiers are devo-anxious and more Eurosceptic, whereas Scottish and Welsh identifiers are, are less so. Now the one area where English identifiers are very much like Scottish and Welsh identifiers is in their desire for some sort of improved or enhanced self-government. And that links to the first two points. Now, whether you see the fact that British identity works in different ways in different parts of Britain as a, as a challenge, 
or just as a fact that might be present in any in any multinational state does depend to a certain extent on your constitutional preferences. But it, it certainly presents a challenge in terms of analysis. So we know there's lots of analysis out there right now about what happened in Brexit or how we interpret people's political preferences that seats British identity as something that works in the same direction, regardless of where you live in the UK or even in, in Britain. And we know that that's not the case. And so often treating it in that way, often using data sets that are overwhelmingly um, dominated by English respondents leads to, to misunderstandings about how Britishness works differently in different parts of the state. And one of the, one of the associated challenges of that is that it's very hard to summon a sense of British social solidarity uh, and make the claim that we're all in this together if you don't have a unifying identity that we all feel that we share, but that has similar content across the state. Challenge number four, I would say, is, is one of ambivalent unionism. So support for independence in England is not particularly high. It's usually only at around 10%. But we have a, a question we ask that says, right, um, do you want independence uh, or is the union uh, the union a priority for you and you want it to remain or a middle ground option a kind of ambivalent unionist option which says well you know i i want the union to stay as it is but if one or more other parts of the of the union decide to go their own way then then so be it and what we see is that around 10% want independence but in england fully 40% would be in that kind of ambivalent unionist uh, that ambivalent unionist category. And if we turn to the English identifiers, people who prioritize their English identity, then we're up to a third wanting independence and a third who are ambivalent unionists. And you might say, well, you know, English identifiers, English not British identifiers, that's, that's a small proportion of the electorate. But if you look at other identity categories, you have to go all the way over to the British side so British, not English, before you're finding smaller proportions of people who are not ambivalent unionists. And even then, among those people who describe themselves as British first and foremost, you've still got a quarter of them saying, well, I like the union, but if one or more other parts wants to go their own way, then so be it. So in England as a whole, you have a commitment to the union as it stands that is conditional on on certain things and I can talk about what it's conditional on more later in the in the Q&A and the last challenge really is is this devolution paradox so people want people are fine with regional government um, but they want policy uniformity across the state and this is particularly true in England so they don't mind the devolved legislatures but they want all of those devolved legislatures to make identical decisions and one might think that devolved legislative competence and policy variation would, would go hand in hand, that one would follow automatically from the other, not least because a desire to do things differently was such an important part of the campaign for devolution, particularly in Scotland and Wales. But that's not the case. There is an overwhelming support for policy uniformity in England and also for policy uniformity between the EU and the UK after it leaves the EU. So that conundrum is not just limited to to devolved legislatures. So if you put all of those things together, a desire for English voice and, and furtive treatment of, of asymmetrical devolution, the challenge of England, England's size, which means that proposals that solve one problem don't solve a competing one, the inconsistent operation of British identity, which creates challenges for analysis, but also limits appeals to, to solidarity or claims that we're all in this together, the presence of ambivalent unionism, but also a desire for policy uniformity, then, then none of what happened in COVID is surprising. So the frustration over policy variation, the lack of clarity about when UK decisions or announcements applied to the UK or Britain or, or just England. But what, what COVID has provided is a transparent opportunity to evaluate um, what's going on. You know, voters often evaluate governments, but what they, you know, say you're interested in education policy in country A and country B. Well, country A and country B might not be grappling with identical 
uh, identical problems, and they might not be creating policy in tandem. But what the pandemic has provided is a situation to which everyone needs to react simultaneously. So we're able to evaluate government reaction simultaneously in real time to the same problem. So it facilitates um, kind of voter evaluations of what different levels of government are doing. It's so interesting, but it's because it's a case where the UK is continually addressing the same problem by switching between its roles as government for the UK uh, and, and government for England alone. So just two brief things to, to close. If we look at the UK government's coronavirus press conferences in March and April, we can look at three different things. We can look to see whether they mentioned the devolved administrations or the first ministers at all. We can look to see whether they clarified the territorial reach of, of UK-wide policy. Uh, and we can also look to see whether they clarified if something applied only to England, whether that was in fact the case. And what we find is that across the first couple of months, the devolved administrations or the first ministers were mentioned only a handful of times, usually uh, because of meetings that they were attending. The territorial reach of, of UK-wide policies or announcements, those were specified around 50 times across the two months. But when it comes to clarifying when things that applied only to England actually stretched only to England's borders, then that happened once in March and four times in April. So an improvement, admittedly, in April, um, but an improvement from a very low base and not really reaching a very high um, high level. Um, and so this and this feeds into work from from Cardiff's journalism school about media treatment of devolution and the fact that there has been only a slow recognition of variation across the territories, which is all to say that the, the COVID pandemic has has revealed what was long true about the benign neglect of territorial variation and asymmetrical devolution, and it has highlighted the extent of a governance gap in England. The focused attention as a result of it, though, about the way we understand policy competence, about the extent of asymmetry, about the need for clarity, it could well be that the COVID pandemic has brought about changes that 20 years of devolution had not yet brought us. And I'll leave it there. Great, thanks very much indeed. Elsa, thanks very much indeed to all of our uh, presenters. And then we've got some time for some Q&A. Um, I don't know if Mike and Patrick, you want to kind of bring your uh, cameras back on. It might be good if people can see you. Um, and uh, I think we, we had one question. I'll come on to uh, one that's been posed by Ed Kavanagh in the chat. But we had one question before we started, which um, was, uh, you know, there, there, there seems to be in the politics of England, uh, you know, a sort of long standing historical uh, I think the question even calls it ancient uh, um, commitment to the national government and trust in English national government, and in contrast, a distrust of local uh, or regional government, or at least less of an attachment, which may help to explain, of course, the politics of what Patrick was talking about in local government and Mike too, um, about regional government. Um, so I, I just wonder if, if, if um, I mean, perhaps uh, Elsa, I think this is something that, you know, you may well have covered in your surveys in the Future of England survey in particular. Um, you know, do we see this historical continuity of attachment to English government and to whether that's uh, in Westminster or thought of in different ways versus a relatively weak attachment to local or sub-national government? Yeah, certainly what we find is that there's... Um, greater levels of satisfaction with and, and perceived salience of Westminster rather than local government. Um, and that is true in Scotland and Wales to the extent that the devolved legislatures are seen as more salient than local government. So that, that would be the same in England and in Scotland and in, mm. and in Wales. Um, and then in terms of looking into the future, we know that consistently people have preferred a national solution, so an England-wide solution, rather than local solutions or city, city deals, for example. So there is something about the, the treatment of England as a polity, an indivisible polity, that is seen as separate from 
subsidiarity solutions or you know enhancements to subsidiarity at the local level yeah thanks and i wonder mike and patrick just on this question i mean um uh, one issue here i suppose for this whole debate is um how far we're talking here about uh, cultural or uh, other expressions of identity and how far we're talking about the historical evolution of institutions and their power particularly in the uh, in the British state so for example you know the, the centralization uh, within the British state the Treasury is a very very powerful institution uh, always had a lot of suspicion of uh, local government of allowing uh, other parts of the United Kingdom to have fiscal autonomy in any kind of way and so uh, which may help to explain a lot of the endurance of forms of centralization the Treasury has been a very powerful institution for centuries um, so I just wonder if you could address that challenge too perhaps how far are we talking about institutions and how far about culture and identity shall I jump on that first um, mm, Mike, yeah. mean, it's, a, it's a big question I mean I'll just give a, a couple of thoughts in answer to it I mean I think the I, I think it is important actually to separate those things out because um, you know there are I, 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 in terms of some of the things that I think Elsa is talking about do uh, really do reflect a sort of history of centralization which goes along with I think an understanding of the UK as a unitary uh, entity which has you know is, is pretty deeply embedded I think in um, in different parts of England but it also does coexist with um, expressions of and feelings of English identity that are very locally rooted uh, and that are actually quite differentiated so that people feel very strong loyalties, as I mentioned earlier, to their counties or to or to, or to some of the local places in which they live. I, I think it's been a mistake uh, by a lot of social scientists actually to assume that those things are are zero sum that people either are uh, proud of their locality or proud of their English identity and I think the future of England survey series shows very well that that actually those two things often sort of run together in many parts of England but I also think that the the so whilst I, in, in many ways I think what else is finding isn't isn't in a way that surprising there is a deeply ingrained pattern there um I also do think though the one one thing I'd point to is whether a sort of more recent current, it seems to me, is a sort of hardening of opinion outside some of the big metropolitan centres in England of attitudes towards London and of, of the idea of London based government. Um, and, you know, I think that is quite a deeply rooted development. I think you can see it really hardening after the financial banking crisis and the, the responses to that of government and it feeds in some ways into Brexit. And the question I that raises is whether there, that will create the, a channel that those arguing for devolution with it at the subnational level can build on. I don't think it's automatically the case that people will, it necessarily turns into mass support for Metro mayors, but I think it does create a slightly different countervailing dynamic within that story. Thanks Mike. Patrick. Um, just to jump in with a couple of very quick points, Nick. Um, I, mean, I think in terms of the story about subnational government in England, it is just important to kind of just acknowledge that um, obviously the, the devolution and elected mayor story has been really important, but it's still the case that around four fifths of the English population aren't covered by city region mayors and combined authorities. So the predominant mode of governance for that population is um, the tradition of English local government. Um, just two quick points that relate to that would be that I think what's interesting about English local government is it continues to attain quite high levels of trust from citizens. And that's, of course, important in terms of the pandemic, because building on the points I was making earlier about the response to the health crisis and in particular issues like the management of public health. Um, I think one of the seriously missed opportunities in English governance in the crisis has been not to have utilised the local government sector much more actively. Um, precisely because um, it tends to have a more established relationship of trust with local populations. I wouldn't over egg that because it's also true to say that in to some extent um, the population's view of local government is indifferent, you know, turnouts tend to be quite low in local government elections as we know, um, but nonetheless there, there is that sort of relationship of trust there which is important. Just coming quickly to the identity institutions point, I mean the other point I would just make quickly is that I think in the golden era of English local governance, which could be broadly described as the period from the Second World War through to the late 1970s, 
Yeah, that golden era, so-called, was achieved at least in part by the sense of a strong partnership between central and local government. There were shared aims, particularly around social reconstruction, the development of the welfare state, dealing with problems of housing, universal education. And that gave local government a kind of solidity and rootedness because of the sense that it was helping to deliver central national priorities, but in a spirit of cooperation and partnership. And it's really, I think, the loss of that shared purpose, which has um, particularly weakened local government sector in England, and I think helps to understand why, as I was saying earlier, you know, the sector is, it, it faces this, this problem of demoralisation in the sense, perhaps, um, a loss of purpose and, and, a, and a loss of identity. So I do think the institution's point is really important, um, notwithstanding, you know, the, the comments that um, Mike made about identity. Great. Thank, thanks very much, Patrick. Um, uh, I think in the time we have, I'm going to sort of take a bundle of questions and then just put them to you and ask you to respond as you see fit. Um, uh, and I've also got, I think, Michael Cashman earlier and Anne Jack raising their hands. And I confess with this technology, I don't know now what to do with those unless they type a question into the Q&A. So it would be great if you were able to do that. But um, so Ed Kavanagh saying, you know, uh, given what Alicia was saying and um, uh, particularly about unreliable information, uh, you know, how do you trigger change? You know, can you rely on, on a referendum to avoid referendums? And I suppose that, that's a broader question there about whether, uh, you know, what will be the processes of change uh, for the future of the union and for devolution within England? You know, should there be a constitutional convention, as people have argued, forms of citizens' assemblies? Um, what are the, uh, you know, or will there be a, a continuation of these kind of messy, uh, processes of elite governance with um, uh, you know processes in the in the nations pushing back um, so that that's one question uh, another one from Keith McDonald who argues well you know shouldn't we have an English Parliament so to come to the points that Mike raised in his first ambiguity um, a federal reworking uh, with the House of Lords disappearing I mean some some argue it should become a Senate of the nations and regions uh, but it would be good to get the panels take a little bit on um, you know, if if the only way out of this for the UK is a new federal or quasi-federal constitution, if it doesn't involve an English parliament and it doesn't involve English regions, what is the answer for England in a quasi-federal United Kingdom? And then my, my final point, which I just wanted again to ask our panellists, was the role of politi political parties. Um, because uh, certainly in the 20th century, um, Political parties played an integrative role. The, the you know the, the Conservative Party, the Liberal Party, and the Labour Party were all national parties, with the exception of Northern Ireland. Uh, and now, of course, um, uh, that's changed quite dramatically, particularly of course first and foremost in Scotland. So, uh, what happens when political parties don't provide the sort of UK-wide integrative role that they did, and in fact, political party dynamics become um, uh, as it were, in, at least if not destructive, in competition with some of the institutional uh, demands of the union. So that's just my question. I'll, I'll hand it over to you to take those as, as you see fit. And as I said, if, if Michael Cashman and Anne Jack could put a question in the chat, that would be great. But um, perhaps um, uh, uh, Elsa, could we start with you on, on, on those? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that's that's quite a list. Yeah. Um, well, don't sorry, don't take all of them. Take no, 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 I'm not, to I'm not going that, to. Okay? I'm, I also, perhaps it. shockingly, I don't have a solution um, to in terms of English in in terms of English. It's certainly not for me sitting up here in Scotland to say right. What you need to do is, what you need to do is this. So I I just study the uh, people's attitudes and in terms of what would be found to be palatable on the part of the. On the part of the English electorate, but but the the point about information I think is really important, and we found that in I mean one thing we do know from Scotland is that a long referendum campaign might seem like a a thing that would only be of interest to um, political scientists or or people who are absolutely devoted to politics, but a long referendum campaign allowed for policy learning there was a lot of information and education going on over the course of that campaign and that i think is was absolutely crucial and the other thing we know is that 
uh, even in even in the Scottish electorate where devolution is well well established, if we provide people with information about the status quo, it has a tempering effect on their demands for change. So the more people know about what is actually happening on the ground, the the more modest their demands in terms of what they what they want. And I think that's that's important. The other thing is that we know when there is uh, when people are getting it wrong in Scotland and in England about what the uh, arrangements for legislative competence, they are consistently getting it wrong in the opposite direction. So English, in the English electorate tends to overestimate how much the Scottish Parliament can do, and the Scottish electorate tends to underestimate what the Scottish Parliament um, what the Scottish Parliament can do. In terms of, and I'll just talk about the parties point, I mean, what happens if parties aren't playing this integrating role? In a way, that's not, that's a question that isn't unique to UK politics. And in, in Canadian politics, the parties used to speak about brokerage politics. So each party within it should be able to span the various cleavages that exist in Canadian politics. And if they stop doing that, then the state would fall apart. And arguably, the political parties have stopped doing that in the last 15 years, and the state hasn't fallen apart. So par political parties can play that integrative role. But I think at times they also set themselves challenges by identifying that um, integrative role, when in fact, if there was um, greater opportunity for voice at the, the territorial level or the subnational level, then I think we would be further ahead than we are now. I think sometimes that into that that desire to play the integrative role has also served to dampen down um, or or prevent from surfacing possible solutions that might have been appropriate for one part of the UK but not the whole of the UK. Great, thanks. Thanks very much. That, that's very helpful. Uh, Mike, Patrick, uh, over to you to answer anything that you want uh, in the time we have left. Do you want me to leap in so that um, Mike, um, I give um, Mike the, the final word? Um, just to say a couple of points quickly, Nick. So on the question about what is the sort of governance resolution for England, um, just one quick reflection for me looking on the, his the history of English life government reform would be that, I mean, since the mid-1970s, this has been a persistent problem because you've had to, you've made successive attempts to reorganise the structure of local government, but you've created territorial units that um, quite often have relatively low salience with citizens. You know, part of this was about the drive for efficiency. You create larger units, which are supposed to deliver services in a more effective and efficient way, but actually their, their legitimacy and their salience with citizens is quite low. And, and I think this has been a consistent and repeated problem. I mean, just a reflection for me also from my time in government would be that the Labour governments of the 1970-2010 period, as you know, um, tended to favour a kind of quasi-regional solution to the English government's problem. I do wonder on reflection though whether that solution is running out of road and whether the answer now in terms of um, trying to forge some kind of more long lasting consensus with the citizenry would be an approach in which there was some form of national English political institution combined with radical devolution, genuinely radical devolution to English local government. But I mean, I'd be happy to hear other people's thoughts on that. That's just what I've concluded standing back from the evidence. Just a quick word on political parties. I mean, what strikes me in terms of your question, Nick, is just really how divided the two major political parties in UK politics are. I mean, the Conservative Party has this tradition of respecting the importance of devolution and decentralisation of political power to local agents, which um, it's fair to say doesn't command, I think, majority support in the modern Conservative Party. Many Conservative ministers have very strong centralising and controlling instincts. But I think it's also true that with Labour, it doesn't seem to me that Labour has a particularly unified position on the broader question either of decentralisation of political power or indeed a specific resolution for England. And again, the Labour tradition is in some respects a very divided one. I think there is a respect or a recognition of the need for more devolution of political power, but there's also very strong instincts towards um, centralisation, the pursuit of policy uniformity, as Elsa was talking about earlier, um, which makes, I think, also the Labour tradition quite divided. So, I mean, to answer your question, I'm not sure the political parties can play that kind of integrative role in the future. But I'll leave it there. Thanks, Patrick. Mike? Well, I mean, just on this this thing about what what is the answer, I mean, I, I would, 
sort of pull back and say, I think we need to give up on the on the ingrained habit of thinking that there's one English question to which there is one answer. You know, there are different mm. questions really which are coming together in, in quite powerful and, and difficult ways, frankly, for British politics. And they're likely to yield different answers. I mean, one of the questions that I would really want to foreground and that I think politicians and academic commentators need to really get more of a handle on is, is what I think is the sort of decline of English consent. You know, the, the, the sort of assumption that the English were fine with, um, with the model of British parliamentary government and then with the, the, the form of asymmetric devolution. I think the idea that we can just presume that devolution means continuing to tinker with the established devolved arrangements and, and sort of England will somehow sort itself out. That, it seems to me, has run out of road. Mm. Um, and potentially, the, the thinning out of English consent has not disappeared. And I think I think some of the polling evidence that Els has talked about suggests some lingering traditions there. But I do think there is a thinning out of consent. And, you know, if you look at the, the history of this since uh, the, the Blair government introduced the evolution, in, in a very sort of stark way, I mean, the English have never been consulted, have never really been engaged with about what devolution elsewhere means to them or indeed what kind of, of, of relationship they want with their own governing structures. And again, that, that, that the absence of that reflected an assumption about English consent. But I'm just struck, even at the anecdotal level, I remember doing some talks around the Scottish referendum of 2014. The question I was asked at every single talk is, when do we get a vote? And of course, there was a bit of antsiness about that uh, uh, that you find. But there was something it, I kept being asked, it and, I, and I began to wonder if there's something behind this, which is perhaps a little bit deeper. So I think, having said that, I mean, I think the important point about that is that British, the only arena where this can be meaningfully taken forward, at least initially, is in British politics. It's within the parties because, you know, there is no other, there's no other sort of, um, a system where that can really take these ideas forward and engage the English public with them. Now, it does seem to me that as well as thinking about multiple possible answers, I suspect uh, the answers we may find a way to are messy and combined models of different different bits of devolution. And I think I slightly disagree with Patrick. I think there is something about the middle layer um, focus that's very important. But I also think it is time to look harder as something at the level of England. But I think the politicians have a responsibility here to engage with this, to, to pull this out of the kind of political football that it, it has become, and to try to think of ways of actually going through that process of information generation, of education, of engagement, because it's just not happened in England. And you know, to leap to the to, to read off from an opinion poll of say, let's let's have a referendum on this. I mean, that that clearly it would be a very, very high risk kind of move to make in a context where the sort of engagement level of, of, of grasp and engagement with these issues is so low. Great, thank, thank you very much in, in, indeed, Mike. Well, uh, we could go on talking about this for, for, for a long time. It's a fantastic uh, uh, discussion and there's you know, loads of really uh, complex and fascinating issues at stake. So thanks very much indeed to uh, all of our panel and their for their presentations and their responses to the questions. Thank you. Elsa, thank you. Mike, thank you. Patrick, um, and thank you everybody for joining the session um, and to the uh, Central on Constitutional Change for uh, for hosting us today. Um, I hope you enjoyed it and uh, got a lot out of it. And I'm sure we will be debating these issues at length uh, in the in the year ahead. Uh, the politics of all this are not going anywhere fast. So thanks very much indeed, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.